oh, you're going to want to stay tuned for this. If you want to hear some new things going on in the world of stem cells right here in the United States, uh, from skin to organs to the brain, you name it. Oh, we dive into another great topic with Dr. Joy Kong, uh, the brain in ketamine, right? So, hmm. Can we have neuroplasty? That's the brain regenerating itself. Can we move it around traumas faster? Well, you have to stay tuned to this show and to see what's new in the world of stem cells. Check it out. I want to give thanks to one of our sponsors, Cyto Defend. Look, at a time like this, I think that our immune system and keeping our immune system up right now is more important than ever. I can also tell you that I pay attention to the things that keep my immune system on par and healthy. So, so glad that Cyto Defend is one of our sponsors here on Cell TV. And it's a product that I use, my family uses, and hopefully you'll check it out. And by the way, you can check it out with the link right here below. If you wanna try a free bottle, you can actually get a free bottle, just pay the shipping. And I think you'll reorder after that, but check it out. If you're listening to this podcast and want to access the amazing CytoDefend product Dr. Pompa just mentioned, please visit freeimmunity.com. Again, that's freeimmunity.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm Ashley Smith, and today we welcome triple board certified physician in psychiatry, addiction, and anti-aging, Dr. Joy Kong. Through her, her quest to bring holistic healing to patients, she became a champion and pioneer in the fields of both stem cell therapy and ketamine therapy. And she's here to talk about how to stay young, happy, and wise through both of these modalities. So let's get started and welcome Dr. Joy Kong and of course, Dr. Pampa. Welcome both of you. Hi, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, well, Dr. Joy, I you know had so many people say, "Oh my gosh, you, you don't know Dr. Joy yet." And uh, <laughs> yeah, so, anyways, we we I got to have dinner one night when I was out there in uh, Newport, and it was it was great. We had so much in common. I got to hear your story, which um, I mean, of course, you could just look at your resume and be impressed. But I was way more impressed after I hear my story. So I'm going to make you tell it here. But you know, <laughs> th I, this topic, uh, stem cells. Uh, obviously, it's near and near and dear to my heart for two reasons, right? Uh, it's healed my back, my neck, and and my knee. I mean, I've had great experiences, and just for anti aging purposes, it's had a huge effect on the ways I've been measuring my age, right, uh, at the cellular level. And I can tell you, it, this stuff works. You have a really unique approach. We're going to talk about it, um, and very excited. You even have a skincare product that my wife loves. So we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit, uh, bringing the stem cell world to the anti-aging skin. I think everyone wants to hear about that, but we want to hear about your approach and here you are in the U S easily accessible there in California, flying to John Wayne. I mean, come on, it doesn't get easier. Than that. <laughs> but anyways, uh, thank you for being here on the show. You have a wealth of knowledge to bring people, but start with your story because it's, Definitely unique one. Pain to purpose is, uh, you know, what I love in my life. And that's what brought me here. You too. Oh, thank yeah. you for your kind words. Yeah, I, I, I really love meeting you. You know, what a brilliant mind. Um, and you've helped so many people, so many people I know that's in the in the health space. So yeah, so you mentioned, you know, journey and, and apparently without pain, it doesn't make an interesting journey. <laughs> and you've had your own share of pain, you know, for me, it's not exactly a physical level. It's, it's about struggling to get to a destination and how there are all these obstacles laying in front of you. So my earliest obstacle, of course, trying to get to the U.S. was um, the Chinese government really was trying, it was making it as difficult as possible. And the American government also really didn't want anybody to come if they could help it. It seems that way at least. So for a, uh, a penniless student, um, I was 20 years old. My parents were teachers, so no money, no connections, and just wanting to come to this country, that was, you know, it was, there was nothing really, uh, you know, 
it was not easy. So my friends were actually why were, were saying, why are you even trying? Yeah. Because it's pretty much impossible. So, so it's about, you know, having a determination, feeling like that's where I belong. And then I went for it. So I, and then all along the way, you know, it, it's interesting is um, there are times that, you know, it's fun, it's exploration, but it also, there was pain because, you know, I ran into people that may not be the best people, you know, on my path. Um, so I, that's where I wrote the book tiger of Beijing. So I documented that journey It's actually in, in the process, it's been adapted into a movie. Um, so that would be really fun to share that story. Um, people really resonate with it. Not only is it an, an immigrant story, but it's, it's, you know, it's a woman's story, but it's also a human story. So um, a lot of men actually really resonate with the story because of the, you know, the uh, men also ran into bad relationships and, you know, that really took them back many steps. Um, and um, it, it could, you know, there, there, there are landmines in life. So, and how to overcome that and not use that as, you know, an excuse. I, I always say I'm, I'm not a victim. I'm never a victim. I made every decision myself and yeah. I chose to go for whatever I was doing. So I'm, you know, that's just my path. It's, it's, it's interesting path. Um, so coming from, you know, that, that's the, the, the overcoming obstacle part. Um, but it is, you know, I, it does give me a, not the journey itself, but the fact that I grew up in China, yeah. um, having been in touch with Chinese medicine, a more holistic way of looking at the human body, because, it, you know, in Chinese medicine, there's so many, everything's connected, right? And they were seeing meridians and, and all the energy systems. So everything is, it's, you know, has an effect on each other. And that is an approach that really has not been adopted by the conventional medicine, still not yet. Um, so th that, that's why I was so drawn to something like functional medicine where you can connect the dots. So yeah. anyhow, so that's just a quick overview. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I think that's your background perhaps is what created the frustration with um, the medical field here in the United States. Uh, you know, I, obviously you just kind of intuitively because of the way you're raised, I'm sure just looked at it like, gosh, this is backwards right we're not looking for cause you know we're we're just covering things up um so i mean you ucla trained i mean how long did it take you to become frustrated you know within the system well um the fact that we only had it, what seemed to me to be half an hour of a nutritional education maybe it was longer but it felt like half an hour yeah. you know this is this vitamin this vitamin you need the you know this is a food pyramid and that was pretty much it. And how do you expect to really, you know, get people to a good place when you completely ignore nutrition, which is, you know, food is what makes our body. Yeah. And, um, and then the, the kind of prejudice that was going around, like in, even in medical school. So that was what 1999, I remember uh, one of my classmates was a MD PhD student. So super smart. And then we were having a conversation and mentioned something that, yeah, I'm interested in acupuncture. And he said, you know, there has been no evidence that acupuncture works, right? I said, well, have you ever looked at all the evidence that's on the shelf, that reams and reams, maybe most of them are not in English, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist. I just, that was the, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that was, you know, during medical school, but yeah. there was a East West medicine elective where this doctor who was western medicine educated and then educated himself in eastern medicine and he was trying to bring the two together so that was the beginning that i saw there are pioneers who are doing work in this aspect but the problem was i was you know i did internship at the clinic um it's you know they do great work but the problem is that it's still not true integration because mm. they were giving diagnosis as if the person is coming to see a Chinese medicine doctor. And then they're, they're giving a diagnosis as if the person was coming to Western medicine. So it's side-by-side -side diagnosis and then side-by-side -side plan. Um, so yes, you're looking at both aspects, both perspectives, but it's not true integration. That's why I wasn't, it just intellectually wasn't satisfying. And then, and then when I encountered 
uh, functional medicine, which was years later, you know, all the doctors, we all get locked into our specialty because that's how you're trained. You're right. going to specialty, then, you know, you go through your rigorous residency and then you go through your uh, conferences, you know, all the conferences are sponsored, you know, the, the residency, everything is supported by the big pharma, the pharmaceutical, you know, aspects. So you really, it's hard to get out of it. Um, but it was from my own curiosity of wanting to improve my own health. That's mm. what led me to Hippocrates Health Institute. You know, I was, you know, <clears throat> checking out all their healing modalities, you know, the, the, the saunas. And that's when I met this doctor who said he was doing functional medicine. And that's when I asked, what is functional medicine? Yeah. That's how we all, you know, locked in we were. Yeah, exactly. And that <clears throat> opened up a whole new world. Here we are today. I yeah, to and that is true. I felt like there's a chance of true integration because yeah. you can use this, the language of science to explain how the Eastern medicine may have worked. So, right. so then you can actually put the two together. Yeah. Yeah. Before we leave the, your story, really, I have to ask the question of um, why, you know, why you? I mean, meaning that like, what made you think differently? What, why, how is a, a child, did you think you could do it? Or like, what inspired you? What motivated you? What changed your thinking? Uh, you understand that's a bridge that, I mean, I talk about three percenters change the world. I, I think when you're looking at the, you know, multitude of people in China, you're talking about one percenter. What made you a one percenter? Yeah, I always stood out as a kid, um, not in such a, not, not, maybe not in such a good way, because I could never obey the rules. I was a rule breaker. I just couldn't, I just, just couldn't keep it because if I don't think a rule makes sense, I don't regard it that as my rule. So that somebody else made, made it up. So that doesn't mean anything to me. So you can imagine in, in communist China where everybody's wearing the same clothes, you're doing the same thing, there's me not wanting to really be, you know, the way they are. So um, that has always been in me, this rebellion, this wanting to use my own head to think for myself. And I just can't quite get on the program that other people set up for me. So that's, you know, that's one thing. The other thing is that I, I think the way my brain works, I'm interested in so many things and I like putting things together. I see the connections between things. So I think a lot of people are specialists. They get deep into one subject and I'm kind of the, I guess, multidisciplinary. You know, I want to put a lot of things together because I see the connections. Um, yeah, so that's probably what, you know, what got, to me, got me to this point. The fact that I, you know, went into psychiatry and then addiction medicine and anti-aging regenerative medicine. I'm, actually, before that, when I was in China, I was studying architecture. So, so just the way my brain is very porous. You know, I want to incorporate information. Mm -hmm. All right. So <clears throat> let's fast forward now. I mean, functional medicine is a broad term, but stem cells isn't. Uh, what brought you into the stem cell world? Um, first of all, I heard about stem cells and it sounds great. In medical school, they may mention, they mentioned a little bit, but somehow I had the impression they were all in investigative stage. They were all just doing research yeah. until I yeah. met this doctor. So, so they're always pioneering doctors who start to adopt. So this doctor I met, um, started using umbilical cord blood stem cells and on this aut autistic kid. So I met him by chance, you know, when I was trying to study for the board uh, for addiction medicine. And then he said, look at what the teacher has reported of, um, of the response the kid had. You know, I give the, the child this umbilical cord uh, blood derived stem cells and the teacher had written over 30 things of the changes the teacher had noticed in the child like better interaction with other kids, you know, not procrastinating anymore, better focus, you know, be more expressive and, and 40 things. And I, as a psychiatrist, there was a reason I did not go into child psychiatry because of how inept or, well, of, of ineffective the yeah. psychiatric approach was. So I just felt that all these psychiatrists, you know, maybe they meant well, but they didn't have the tools. The only way they could handle the kids was to sedate them. So they throw an antipsychotic at them, 
you know, maybe they, they, you know, they want them to focus a little bit, so they, they throw stimulants. So they think of the kid as a little biochemical factory. They just throw different things to see what sticks. And that just, you don't functional, you don't fundamentally improve the kid's function. Not like what I saw with this simple stem cell IV infusion. And yeah. to see all those changes, you know, organically. And I just, I never, I didn't even think it was possible. So that was very inspiring. Yeah. And, um, and then when I realized, oh, the product is available, can be used, is used as a tissue transplant because it's not a processed product that qualifies as drugs. These are just simple tissue transplant from one human being to another. Um, so I tried it on my first patient who um, was 69 years old and um, had um, knee problems that two orthopedic surgeons told him on separate occasions that he had to have bilateral knee replacement. So he was very active. He, you know, he's in the health space as well, going to all these trade shows. So he said, I, I don't want to have my knee replaced. I, I want to try stem cells as last ditch resort. So I give him an IV infusion because you want to, what I believe to invoke your immune system to help you to repair. Uh, but also the outer one third of the cartilage is nourished by the blood supply. So I want to, you know, target the layer of cartilage from the outside, but also injected into the, you know, the, the, the joint space mm -hmm. and then all together, you know, they come together into a synergistic effect. Um, and um, so now is six years later, he's, he's, you know, he's walking four miles a day. He barely feels he has knees. He's very, very active. And, uh, and what's fascinating was the next day, he said, oh my God, I slept through the night. I haven't slept through the night for 40 years because of my shoulder injury. He had rotator cuff injury where if he shifts in his bed, the sharp pain will wake him up for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And then he slept through the night and he still have slept through the night. Basically the cells, I give him IV through IV, found a place, found that there's a screaming inflammation in that shoulder. So let's just fix it. So the cells went there. He never even told me about his shoulders. So, so that was incredible. And that, that just shows you the intelligence of the cells and how powerful they are. So, yeah. so that, that I, I got hooked, you know, imagine yeah. that as my first case. You know, I remember reading a story, you know, it was about a study that was done where they basically uh, took a young rat and an old rat and sewed it together and shared blood. Oh, yes. Yeah, and it was pretty remarkable because the old rat took on young characteristics in healing from the young rat. Now, here was the bad part. The, the young rat took on some of the old, right? <laughs> yeah, be careful whose cells you use. That's <laughs> true. And that goes to when people use their own you know, cells, well, that's as good as you can get you know, as, yeah. as at your age. So yeah. if you want to get rejuvenated a whole step further, then you've yeah. got to use younger cells. I, I definitely have had a greater healing from younger cells, um, you know, and okay. So it brings up the topic, right? I mean, uh, obviously there's certain things that are legal in the U S you're not allowed to do expanded cells in the U S you could, you know, you'd have to go to Mexico or somewhere else for that. Um, but a lot of people joy still think that stem cells are illegal. Um, so kind of hit that topic a little bit because obviously uh, they're not, there are some gray zones, but talk about that. Yeah, so because it's such a new science, I, I don't think as FDA has really figured out a good way to regulate it because um, from each person, just like blood transfusion, right? Each blood, you know, a, a bag of blood people collect is individual to that person. Right. So the FDA was hoping to regulate it as a drug, but it's really not a drug. You know, it's not created by a laboratory, you know, or, or a, a factory. It's created by nature. You know, they can't, so you, you can't really make it a drug, although the FDA would like to regulate it as a drug. Um, but the thing is, tissue transplant already was regulated by tissue banks, American Association of Tissue Banks. So they have to go through rigorous, you know, the donors have to go through some screening and the tissue has to go through its own screening. And there, there are all these criteria that surrounds this tissue donation. And that's really what the cells 
we use, you know, I use, and, and a lot of other doctors use fall into, you know, that's, it's that category of tissue. So it, it's really unmanipulated human tissue, not dissimilar to, you know, the liver transplant, you know, lung transplant or blood transfusion. So the FDA in its attempt to try to regulate it came up with this um, 2017, there are these policies. So in this policy stated very clearly that if you are not manipulating the cells, which means if you're not using enzymes or chemicals to change the cells or free the cells up, um, and then you do not expand them, which means you didn't make them grow into huge numbers, then is considered a tissue transplant. Well, there's another thing it, it says, what the cells were doing in the body before has to be what the cells is doing in this new body. So if you fulfill all these criteria, um, then it's considered tissue transplant is falls under section 361, which means you don't need a drug approval. You can use it, you know, as medically indicated, but if you're changing the cells in any way, then you need to go through investigation on new drug application. And that is a very involved, very expensive process. And most of these companies who started, you know, producing these tissue transplant products were not able to, they couldn't keep up. It, it was too expensive. It was too laborious for them. So a lot of them ended up going overseas. Uh, but, you know, there's some bad players in the space just because, you know, you have tissue transplant and you've got a system in place where people can make these tissue. It doesn't prevent bad players from coming in. So there are all these business people who saw an incredible opportunity. So they got into the space and they were not adhering to some basic standards, some basic sterility standards. Uh, that's how we got the, the whole, whole outbreak of E. coli contamination. And some labs were secretly expanding the cells without telling anybody. I mean, there are all kinds of shenanigans going on. Um, and that's what infuriated the FDA. You know, it was upsetting because they want to protect the consumers. And that's when they came up with, you know, some, you know, some statements that scared a lot of doctors and the doctors felt that somehow they can't do it, even though there's no law that says stem cell therapy is legal or is illegal. Actually in, you know, various states in, in Texas, definitely is legal. You can do stem cell therapy. So that's no problem. And then, you know, at first they passed the Charlie's law, made stem cell therapy legal. And then they they kind of backtrack, not backtrack, they added another requirement saying, well, it has to be under a clinical study. Um, and in California, like if you, anyone coming to my clinic, um, uplift, <laughs> they will see on the door is it, it posted um, this, um, the um, Senate bill 512. So that is a bill that passed in California saying that, yes, you can do stem cell therapy, but you have to post this. It says that this is not an FDA approved therapy. And then you, you understand, you know, what basically what you're doing and you have discussed with your primary care doctor, mm -hmm. that's all you need to do to start performing stem cell therapy. So, so in, in a sense, that's basically California saying it is, it is legal. You just need to advise people. Yeah. I mean, there's still, I warn a lot of people in the space because they go to, you know, X, Y, Z, um, person, you know, who knows, you know, they, they probably just started doing stem cells a year ago and they're getting stem cells. I mean, meaning that, uh, at worst, most often they're just not very active, vibrant cells that are going to drive healing. Right. So their experience isn't all of, you know, what they thought it would be. And perhaps they paid a lot of money for that. Right. So I think it is important to know who you go to and what cells uh, you're utilizing, which brings me to the next question is what makes your process uh, so unique? Uh, what are you doing different in the space? Um, so when I first got into the space, um, I was looking, I was using umbilical cord blood products. And then I quickly realized that you know, there's almost, well, there's at most 1% of mesenchymal stem cells. And yet that's what the company was talking about almost at all the presentations. What they were talking about was the benefit of mesenchymal stem cells. And when I got down to it, when I drilled the, 
<laughs> owner of the lab tell, to tell me exactly what the percentage mesenchymal stem cell was in their product. And then I found out it's about 1%. And that was very disappointing. And that could explain some of the more side effects that people were experiencing because there was, you know, imagine you have core blood cells um, and it, especially the blood is not purified perfectly. There's some, you know, antigens, you know, you know, of another person's, you know, a, a, a red blood cell fragments. And, um, and, and then you have very little mesenchymal stem cells to calm the immune system, to allow it to be more accepting of, of incoming, you know, kind of, uh, you know, foreign cells, then there's a higher chance that people were getting um, flu-like symptoms, um, chest tightness, sniffling, um, fatigue. So, so that's what, you know, what, what I used at first. And then I realized, oh, so there's all this research about umbilical cord tissue and the umbilical cord tissue is full of mesenchymal stem cells. So that really is what I should use. So then I searched out manufacturers, you know, uh, tissue banks to get those products. So I got really good results, but, you know, in the process of studying and reading different articles, you know, you can't deny that each different cells, different types of cells or different from different tissue compartments, be it core blood or core tissue or amniotic membrane, they have their own benefits. So if you talk with some of the best stem cell scientists in the world, they will tell you that there's no one stem cell type that's going to be good for everything. So, so this comes back to the whole holistic approach um, to, to health. So what, what made me think that I am so powerful that I know exactly what your body needs that because mesenchymal stem cells is good. Then I'll say that this is the only cell type I will utilize. So why did the universe or God, you know, put all these different cell types together? They actually work together and they've shown in research, they do work together. So what I want to do, especially since I've seen benefits from different compartments, then I want to bring them together. So that's what make um, what we use unique. Well, so explain back up a little bit and explain a mesenchymal stem cell, right? Because, you know, they're found in certain tissues, they have certain benefits, right? But we kind of just throw that term out there. I, I think most of the public watching goes, I, I don't even really know what that is. So yeah, Dr. yeah. I just assume saying, most that, people know what mesenchymal, yeah. So mesenchymal stem cells, uh, Dr. Kaplan discovered them and he actually in the last, I think 10 years have been trying to change the name uh, to medicinal signaling cells because he really felt that they were not the quintessential stem cells, but their function is more this overall coordinating effect on the entire human body. Because if you look at their, at their location, they are everywhere in your body. Anywhere you have blood vessels, you have these mesenchymal stem cells. Um, yes, the origin is, is you know, mesoderm. So it's from that particular lineage. But what they ended up doing was huddle, you know, kind of hovering around all these blood vessels everywhere. And they are sensing, so they, they have sensors to, to sense what's going through the blood. And is, is there some place that's needing help because mm -hmm. then they will have in, you know, information, mo different molecules coming through. And then they're also figuring out, you know, what's going on locally. Can I help with what's, you know, what is there damage? Is there, you know, are, are there senescent cells or are there something that I can help? So they have this overall um, monitoring effect but not only monitoring, they actively participate in repair. So if they do sense that something is going around in the blood, there's, you know, some the signals of injury, let's say, they can traverse, getting, squeeze themselves into the blood vessels and swim upstream like a salmon to find where the signal is the densest and then get out of the blood vessel. And then they can exert their benefits in the local area by sending out signals, telling the new cells to come in, you know, white blood cells, you know, come, come here, macrophage, you know, take away the, the damaged cells, let's kill them off. And then, and then talking to the local stem cells, telling them to multiply, you know, to start to differentiate, to produce a new tissue cell. So, so they, they, that's really what their function is. So in the past, you know, people say, oh, can they differentiate, you know, can, can it become cartilage, bone, you know, muscles? Okay, 
yes, they can. And they can even become neurons. But that really is maybe 1% of what they do. 99% research has been resounding in the last 10 years that what they do is this medicinal, this coordinating, orchestrating effect. So that's why it's so powerful. And, and, and without these cells that's coordinating regeneration, then you, you know, then you just, you deteriorate without being able to repair. And that's what happens with the aging process. So I just want to give a quick, quick statistic. You probably already know, but when we were born, every one in 10,000 cells is a mesenchymal stem cell. But when we reach our teenage years, it has already declined to one in a hundred thousand. So you got tenfold less when it comes to ratio. And then when you reach your forties, it but becomes one in 400,000. When you reach your eighties is one in 2 million. So you can see the power that, you know, the engine that drives the regeneration, it just, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're dwindling down. And that's why people are getting, you know, these, you know, the wrinkles, they can't, they can't produce more. Right. And the cartilage start to go because you can't, you can't, make new ones. It's so sluggish. And that's how we eventually, you know, has to do with, you know, how eventually we'll end up dying because we don't have, we just don't, we can't replace it anymore. So, I mean, obviously there's different ways to utilize this, right? Um, these anti-aging signals, these healing signals that are sent, you know, from these mesenchymal stem cells. So if we infuse them, of course, they're sending their signals um, out to the body, like you said, you know, picking up what's going on in the blood, this needs healed, let's release this. I mean, they're, they're literally coordinating healing. Um, but then we can put them directly in places, even including our skin, correct? Yes. And yes. then utilize healing right, right on the spot. So talk about some of the different ways to utilize these stem cells to anti-age and to heal. Yeah. So, um, right. IV, I think, is one of the most powerful methods for sure. Um, and, and they've done experiment on, on rats um, or mice, I can't remember which, but um, by giving IV stem cells and when they dissected the muscle and the brain of these animals that got the infusions and their older animals, all the markers, you know, the acetylcholine level, growth factors, you know, the inflammation markers, everything has gone down to the younger state. So that can, that shows you how powerful the IV methods is. No, no, but, I've, read, I've read studies that, you know, where, okay, you do a, an infusion of um, stem cells, which I've done. And within the first day, they end up right in the lungs within hours, actually, right in the lungs. And it's been criticize that well there they get pinched off they die you know but yeah, yeah because yeah, no. we didn't find them in the liver that we damaged purposely right we didn't find them um which response to that that's that's probably earlier research you know just because they can't detect the signals because you know they, they're trying to detect certain signals when the cells get so diffused they can't they can't see the signals doesn't mean that they're not there exactly. um so that has been debunked um, within three days, the cells will disperse into the, the, the you know, general circulation, um, especially if you don't have lung uh, pathology. So if your lungs, if your lungs have all these inflammation, then it's going to keep the cells there. It's going to attract the cells. But if your lungs are fine, then this rest of the cell will quickly, you will get back to the circulation within three days. So, um, you know, a lot of them are aggregated in, in highly perfused areas like the liver, the spleen, the heart. Um, and, but, but then they will, they do, you know, get to, you know, all kinds of, you know, tissues, um, like how they, like how I was able to, there's one liver cirrhosis patient I treated. Uh, he was in hospice and he had a full recovery with one treatment. Um, you would, wouldn't think that's, you know, very much cells, you know, I, but they broke down the scar tissue. They reversed his liver enzyme elevation is pretty remarkable. Um, so, and also the fact that it's aggregating in a place doesn't mean that they're trapped, you know, oh my God, you know, they they can't work because they're trapped. Uh, yeah, exactly. um, but you know, like the spleen is really important. They may be there for a good reason because they're talking to the spleen because it's a powerful immune, immune organ. Um, so I think the picture is much more complex. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't believe, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that's true. You know, with the trapping, I hear that a lot, that that was an, kind of an earlier version of what people's concern were. Um, but when it comes to local, 
areas, definitely, you know, if you put something locally, you're going to get higher concentration, right? It's not diluted throughout the body. So we can inject into the skin, into the scalp for hair restoration. Um, we can do intramuscular, you know, and then tendon repair, joint repair. Um, I've injected into the penis, vagina, you know, for health, uh, sexual wellness. So you can, you can do a lot of different things with these cells. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, and I think the combination of systemic and local is the best combination um, ever. At least I've seen the best results. Uh, yeah. Personally. That's what I always favor. Um, especially I tell people, cause people will come to me for uh, muscular skeletal problems, right? Joint problems. And if I always say, if you're under 50 and what caused your joint issues was sports injury. Okay. Let's just, we can just target just the joint and, you know, we just treat joint. We don't have to do the IV. That's okay. Let's fix your joint. If you don't injure it again, you're good. But if you are, you know, over 50 and it's not, it's something that's chronic, that's, it's been going on. It's not from an acute injury. Maybe at some point there was an injury and you're fine, but as you get older, you couldn't repair it very well anymore. And um, the osteoarthritis that people think are a result of aging, are a result of wear and tear, it's just completely it's off the mark because it's not a wear and tear disease. It's an inflammatory disease yeah. because they've shown if you put a knee construct, right? A, a, a piece of cartilage you put in the osteoarthritic knee, put in the knee, it gets chewed up. That cartilage gets damaged because the environment is so inflammatory. So you've got to change that environment. And that's what these cells can do. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, you created, like I mentioned at the top of the show, the, the skin product. Uh, talk about that. How does it relate to the stem cells? Yeah, so um, really started with me being frustrated. I couldn't find a good skincare product. Um, you know, knowing the damaging effects of all these artificial, you know, uh, synthetic ingredients, how toxic they could be in the body. So I just wanted to find an all natural product. And I just, I couldn't, you know, what set, was said to be natural, you know, it's expensive product, you know, Korean, blah, blah, blah. And then when I flipped the bottle, I actually read the ingredients. I realized there were a lot of artificial ingredients, uh, synthetic ones. And then when I went to trade shows to get some samples, na these natural expos, and I will get some sample and then I put it in the drawer to wait until, you know, maybe a month or two later to try it. And then they were all segregated into different layers. And that really scared me. I wasn't going to put that in my, on my face. So that's when I realized, you know, you know, I do have access to stem cells. I understand peptides. And then I can put all these incredible herbs and natural oils and antioxidants and prebiotics, everything in one. And that's, that's what, um, what, how I came up with the Chara Omni, um, just all natural. And I hate complicated regimen. I always felt like it was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a scam to, you know, when, when these companies say, oh, you need a toner and you need a serum, and then you need a moisturizer. I just, I, I just don't believe that's really, I, I think it's way too complicated. Um, you can deliver all the same benefits using a really, really good you know, all in one cream. So, so what my cream is, it, it has all the capabilities of what all these toner is very deep penetrating. It gets the molecules, you know, into the deeper skin layers. And, and, um, and then, you know, along with all these natural uh, herbs and oils, I mean, there's broad range of benefits. Um, and, and then the stem cells. So the stem cells are not alive. You know, I don't want people to believe that these are live cells on the skin. There's no way it, it's, it's, it's pretty much impossible to keep them alive uh, in a cream. Uh, even if they were, they're not going to get, you know, deep into your skin. It just, it, they can't, that's why we do injections. So, but even, even though they're not alive, all the ingredients, all the early regenerative components, the growth factors are still there. So um, the formula has a way of letting the cell membrane open up so they can release all these ingredients. And that's how we harness the powers of the stem cells. And we'll put a link below. You can click below if you want to know more about that or anything that Dr. Joy is discussing. Uh, check her out at the, the link there. Um, okay, so what it, what's going on in your clinic? You you know we you do face injections. Obviously, some of these technologies directly into the anti you know to help uh, anti age the the skin. 
but um, also, I mean, all of the joint things we're talking about, you do in your clinic, right? So talk a little bit about more what you get if you go to your clinic. Um, so when, you know, when somebody comes to the clinic, it, it's really important, you know, I, ideally they would have already seen a functional medicine doctor. They've optimized their you know, nutrition, you know, you know, release as much toxin as possible from their body and op op optimize their hormones. But if they don't, you know, I can run tests, I can help them, but you know, all these are important. So I always talk about how the stem cells are the engine for regeneration but you need fuel. So everything else that people are doing are important fuel. So you need good, clean fuel to drive the, the vehicle, um, but you also need powerful engine. You can't just have beautiful fuel with really, really, you know, <laughs> degenerated engines. So, so when they come in, you know, either we can, we can do the labs if they haven't done it, um, where I can do as much as I can to optimize our hormones and nutrition. Um, and then we'll decide what their goal was. So half of people who come to me have severe health issues, either autoimmune conditions or musculoskeletal issues, um, degenerative brain conditions, um, COPD, you know, you name it, this wide range of degenerative condition, I mean, um, um, chronic conditions. Um, so for them, it's going to be one red regimen. Right. Um, if they have, you know, mild to moderate condition, we probably want to do two IV infusions to get them to a good place. If they have severe, maybe we'll have to do three. And then we can come to a maintenance stage. Um, and then um, if they come to me for just anti-aging purposes, they're in general good health, then we can do an IV infusion every six months at least. Um, if you want to, you know, really garner the, the uh, anti-aging benefits, but some people are a lot more proactive. They want to do it every four months, every three months, or even every two months. So everyone's a little different, but, you know, so we'll decide on the dosing, which is based on the person's body weight, their age and their health condition. So we'll, we'll make decision on that. And then of course, if they need any particular area that, um, that we can further, you know, uh, regen help regenerate, then we can uh, go with, with, with that. Um, so we have different tools, you know, like ozone therapy, peptide therapy, um, and, um, you know, various vitamin infusions, but we also have ketamine treatments, which yeah. is great for brain I, regeneration. Yeah. I have to ask about that next. I, I, I do, because I, I know that you do that. Uh, I mean, being a trained psychologist, you know, there, there's kind of a, probably was an interest to you. I, I know they use it for addiction. They use it for trauma. Explain, because this may be the first time people have heard ketamine treatments, um, what that means. So kind of explain it and then you know, talk about what you've seen success with. Yeah, so ketamine has been a widely used anesthetic for, for about um, you know, 60 years and is one of the safest anesthetics there is. So basically, you know, doctors can give it to people and do operations. And they often use ketamine for people who are at high risk of cardiovascular uh, or pulmonary collapse because these, the, the, the ketamine doesn't suppress breathing. It's, it's extraordinarily safe. So that's what it was used for. Uh, both for you know adults, for pediatrics, for animals. So it's widely used, but at much, much, much lower dosage. That's when a person maintains consciousness. So you're not knocked out. You're fully aware of what's going on. Of course, there are different levels of consciousness, and that you know the different dosing will get you to different places. Um, at much lower, you may just feel you know more relaxed and 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 you know possibly slightly like watching a movie and, and you have a different perspective about, about life, about experiences. And um, at deeper levels, you may feel like you possibly out of your body, you know, that you are, you know, experiencing maybe different dimensions that you've never experienced before, either, either visually um, um, or just a, a perceptual. Some people just, you know, the, is what they feel, not exactly what they see. Everybody's a little different. So it is the only psychedelic, you know, in that sense, in that, at that dose, it is a psychedelic. So it's the only FDA approved psychedelic that's used for medical treatment. So it's, it's 
FDA indicated for treatment resistant depression, but it has been really helpful for anxiety, PTSD, chronic pain, um, and an addiction. So it does things in a very, in a novel way, um, probably similar to various um, psychedelics, but, but, you know, it definitely has its own special properties. Um, what they know, they do know is that ketamine help release more brain derived neurotropic factor. So it helps you grow neurons. So instead of hitting the receptors that like the usual antidepressants and, you know, different antipsychotics, they're bombarding on the receptors. So these can interact with some receptors, you know, that that's fine, but that's not the main reason, you know, main pathway of how it heals the body or the brain. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the, the you know, helping the growth of new synapses so right. you can rewire the brain. That's why it has been so powerful for PTSD. I mean, I've worked uh, for four years in the veterans hospital and I've seen, you know, so many veterans with all these, you know, severe PTSD, you know, starting from the second world war, you know, Normandy landing um, and, and they live with it. No matter how much medication I give them, no matter, no matter how much talk therapy I give them, um, it's there. It's, it's, they, they just have to live with it. But when you're using ketamine, I've seen people being able to almost like bypassing instead of being, a, being stuck in this hypervigilant, hyperreactive state, whenever this memory is encountered, all of a sudden, that is just a memory. It doesn't take on this overly, you know, bigger than life, you know, significance. It becomes something that's, that you can put in a box saying, okay, that's an experience. That's too bad. But I, I'm able to live. I'm not responding viscerally to that anymore. So, I mean, it's, is it, trained psychologists, you know, you can like, you know, walk people, talk people around that. And eventually neuroplasty happens where, you know, they, they think about that trauma very differently and it doesn't give the same trauma. So you're saying that it can expediate that. You're saying that it helps neuroplasty go faster, meaning neuroplasty, meaning the brain literally creating new connections and regenerating itself. Are you saying it speeds up the process? In, in all my practice, the PTSD is extraordinarily difficult to treat, no matter how much therapy you, 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 know, you, you give. Um, you can dampen the, the anxiety, depression associated with it. You can help the person to gain a little bit more perspective, but the reaction, the, the visceral reaction, it's, it's almost, it, I, I've seen very few or, or any, I mean, I've, you know, talk with a lot of colleagues is extraordinarily difficult to treat. But with ketamine, the person could have transformational changes with a few sessions. Um, mm -hmm. That's how fast things can happen. Um, that's why suicidal thoughts, right? Suicidality can be knocked out with one treatment. And that's incredible. And I think it's not just the brain derived neurotropic factor. Um, when they They've done research looking at what happens to the brain under ketamine. They were looking at the brain waves. What happens to them is that they have these high gamma waves, very prevalent um, that you don't see, except for people who are these high priests or you know these monks who have meditated for over ten thousand hours in their lifetime. When they meditate, they're able to have that high gamma state. Mm -hmm. So we all know meditation does wonders, and it really can it, you know it can be transformational. So Ketamine is able to get you into that state of these incredible meditative, um, you know, kind of brain. So then, it, then basically you're, you're able to neuroplastically change the, your brain, the way you think about trauma. And now you're not getting the visceral reaction anymore because simply doesn't have that same emotional anchor there. Right. Anymore. Yeah. I'll give you an example. So one of my patients, um, he had a beloved dog that was ran over by a FedEx, FedEx truck. So he could not even look at the, the urn. He had an urn um, that he couldn't look at it without bawling. He just couldn't, he couldn't even think about it. He couldn't, you know, he just, it's something he had to stay away from. After a few ketamine sessions, he was able to take the urn, open it up, take the paw print of the dog and went to the tattoo artist and got it tattooed on his arm. He's able to bypass this, this trauma that he couldn't, you know, he was bawling for two years. 
And then all of a sudden it's okay. He can remember, you know, he, you know, he can hold on to loving memories without this, you know, overwhelming visceral kind of collapse kind of reaction. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's interesting. And also um, you have at your clinic, you have people come in for sessions of that. How long do the sessions last? Um, and you know, how typically on average, how many do they need? Um, the sessions. So for all the mental health issues usually is an hour, um, for chronic pain. So people with chronic pain, migraines, that's two hours of the infusion. So, um, I give them a loading dose to kind of, um, uh, get to the brain uh, to be more saturated with the chemicals. So get them to a state, um, and then basically, really within thirty seconds to a minute, they they get to into that state. And then there's a steady infusion. I can change the time. I can, you know, I, I can really design however fast, however you know amount I want to I want to infuse. Um, the 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 recommendation for any condition <clears throat> is that. Um, that you want to do at least six sessions uh, in the first two to three weeks to strengthen the new neural network. So if you just do one, people may feel great relief right after or for a few days after, um, even up to a week. But then the previous symptoms will start to creep back because you know our own, you know, the stresses from life and you know everything just start to come back to where it was. That's why you want to do another session. So you're strengthening the new pathway. Um, so that's a recommendation. After that, you can do somewhat of a maintenance stage. You can slow it down maybe once a week or once every two weeks, and then once a month as maintenance. So a lot of people, you know, after they get to a good place, they don't need to do that anymore, um, but they like doing it because it gives them perspective. I do see a lot of people, especially people who are very accomplished, who are under a lot of stress, um, they sometimes come to crossroads, you know, what, what decision do I make? I'm, you know, I'm you know, overwhelmed. And then they want to do a session because it takes them out of this level of stress and, and, and obsession and give them a whole different perspective. So, so they really like that. They, they get a lot of, out of it. Um, so that's an, another use I've seen. Well, Dr. Joy Kong, thank you for <laughs> being a guest on Cellular Healing TV. And um, for more information about Dr. Joy and the Uplift Clinic, there's a link below. Um, a lot of reasons uh, to visit California and to visit <laughs> Joy and yeah. woman here and all her, the things that she's doing. Thank you for it all. And uh, your product, again, link below uh, for people that are interested in the product that you mentioned as well. So, um, yeah, very informative. Uh, lots here. And we could, if we had more time, we'd expand on all of it. But um, thank you for what you've done in this, uh, in this field and um, all that you do. Yeah. We all want complete healing, right? We don't want just to have a great body, but with a sluggish or, or, or sad mind, you know, that, so that's why, you know, I want to incorporate everything, you know, I'm not happy with just healing the body. And I also want to heal the mind. Yeah. You know, it's kind of unique, right? You, you treat the, the physical body, the aches, the pains, the dysfunction, the mind, well, it's part of your background, uh, you know, and the beauty. Yeah. You know, look, I, I, you know, I, it's all important. Every, every, <laughs> you know. Uh, that's right. Inside uplift. out, up, up, down. <laughs> uplift. That's the, that's the name of your that's clinic, right. Right? The longevity your center. Body and your mind. All right. Well, <laughs> now what you're doing is great work uh, on the stem cell area. And it sounds like, you know, you're doing a lot of other incredible work with the brain and the mind. So uh, good stuff. And I'm sure we'll have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pampa. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey, I want to tell you about one of our sponsors, Cyto Detox. Look, podcasts cost money. There's a lot of production uh, going around this, but uh, we are grateful to have Cytodetox as one of the sponsors. It's so easy for me to talk about the product because myself and my family use it constantly as we practice what I preach. For over 15 years, I've talked about and taught doctors and the public about cellular detox. And I'll tell you, Cyto was a breakthrough. Cyto was a breakthrough for us. Um, and it's changed so many lives. So we're grateful that they sponsor Cellular Healing TV. It makes sense, doesn't it? They should.
If you're listening to this podcast and want to access the amazing Cyto Detox product Dr. Pompa just mentioned, please visit detoxoffer.com. Again, that's detoxoffer.com. Well, that's it for this week. The materials and content within this podcast are intended as general information only and are not to be considered a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you would like to purchase some of the supplements mentioned on this show, please visit the site as seen on chtv.com and use the code chtv15 for 15% off. Again, that's as seen on chtv.com. Use the code chtv15 for 15% off. And as always, thanks for listening.